Good morning, everyone. I'm going to introduce our PBR speaker today. We're really excited to have Dr. Sidhana Jackson joining us from the National Institutes of Health, where she's the principal investigator at NI. NDS, as well as the head of developmental therapeutics and pharmacology. She attended Hampton University for her bachelor's of science and then pursued an MD at Eastern Virginia Medical School. She went on to uh, do her residency in pediatrics in Orlando Health. She did a very prestigious fellowship in pediatric hemonc at St. Jude's, followed by uh, an equally esteemed program in a fellowship in pediatric neuro-oncology and clinical pharmacology at Johns Hopkins University. She's board certified in pediatrics as well as pediatric uh, hematology and oncology. She has both clinical expertise and a really robust research program studying how to uh, target the blood-brain barrier for uh, patient benefit in pediatric malignant gliomas. Some of her really uh, excellent work here that we'll hear about today studies um, efforts on drug delivery, blood-brain penetrance, and tumor microenvironment in those glioma settings. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sidhana Jackson. Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right. So I am Dr. Sedona Jackson. You were supposed to mention that I have a sense of humor. <laughs> You're going to see that throughout my talk. So we'll just go with that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about a love of mine, which is the blood brain barrier and the blood tumor barrier and its clinical relevance. Me as a neuro oncologist, if I can click through this, this is not advancing. Okay. I have no financial disclosures. I work for the National Institutes of Health, so that's very hard to have any financial disclosures. Um, so just an outline of the talk, I'll define challenges of the blood-brain barrier, the blood tumor barrier, or you'll hear, hear me call it the BBB-BTB of malignant gliomas, bench to bedside, and then back to bench studies. Everyone loves to hear those stories. And then any ongoing studies. So I have to give you... Um, just a heads up that when I had to fill out the paperwork to say that I was going to be giving a talk at uh, with Virginia Tech and DC Children's, NIH made sure that I say I cannot talk about anything that's not published just yet. So this talk will be a little bit different because I do have some new and upcoming fresh things that are right about to be published that I can't talk about too, too much. But I'm putting it in the context in the frame of collaboration ideas and assays that we're currently have ongoing and can perform so that we can do some collaborative studies. So I'll talk about that. And then I'll also talk about our open and enrolling now clinical trial that looks at neuropharmacokinetics. So just about my academic journey, I did start at Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. And then I went from there to do a medical school at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Then I went to Orlando Health and did my pediatric residency. So you can only imagine the amount of fun and jest that comes with uh, visiting Orlando and specifically all the amusement parks down there. So as a resident, anytime a patient gets sick, a child, at the amusement park, they came to Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital, Orlando Health. So we saw a slew of uh, various rare diseases, conditions, disorders that I would not have seen had I trained at any other institution. So I was very grateful to have trained at Orlando Health and to just see so many different diseases, disorders, conditions. I remember there was an um, inborn errors of metabolism type conference in the area. Um, and they told all the children, if you get sick, make sure you go to this hospital. And so we were trying to figure out how to replace electrolytes, fluids for these kind of rare disease that I wouldn't have known or um, have been comfortable in dealing with had I not been at Orlando Health. Then I went from there to Memphis, Tennessee, very hot, like 9 p.m. at night, still 95 degrees, sweltering. Um, awesome research opportunity for three years, and I did a PET Monk fellowship. And then it was there that I really got to understand and was excited by the multidisciplinary care of pediatric neuro-oncology. And I said, I really want to be a part of a group, a part of a tribe. So we have our neurosurgeons, we have our child life specialists, we have our radiation oncologists, all of those uh, great people and all that expertise pouring into all this one patient who has this brain disorder. Um, and so I followed up my interest and went to Johns Hopkins and did a pediatric neuro-oncology. And because I thought, you know, why not do an additional fellowship at that time? I did a clinical pharmacology fellowship to look more about the neuropharmacokinetics of the drugs that we give. 
So then that led me to the National Institutes of Health, which I've been there since 2015. So if you're unaware of what NIH is, it's the National Institutes of Health. It's about 27 institutes and centers coming all together to really uh, look at health and disease of, of patients. It was created in 1887 as a one-room laboratory, really in New York, and then it was officially designated by Congress in 1930. It's the world's largest source of medical research funding. So you may know NIH of, it's the, the giver of funds, it's the giver of money. I actually work in the, ex, the intramural uh, section of the NIH. You probably know more about the extramural, so the giving aspect of it and not the internal. But overall, our mission is to seek fundamental knowledge and apply that to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. So overall, just a great place that has both an internal or intramural component as well as an extramural component to look at research and really helping others. And so I've been with um, the National Institutes of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, as well as the National Cancer Institute. And specifically as a pediatric neuro-oncologist, I care for children and young adults, specifically with a really aggressive high-grade type tumor or grade four glioma. And so we explore time-dependent changes, dual role therapies, and pharmacology as a re, um, as it results from or related to these really aggressive type tumors. So when I say grade four glioma, it really encompasses a varied um, tumors. So glioblastoma, which you probably heard of, and they just recently changed the classification in the World Health Organization in 2021. So you can't just say G GBM or you can't just say high-grade glioma, malignant glioma. But in the context of this talk, we'll just say high-grade glioma just because of historical lens. But that includes glioblastoma, astrocytoma, diffuse astrocytoma, and diffuse hemispheric glioma. And so that's our research focus, both on the laboratory and clinical side. And so why that is so important is because survival is so poor. So if we look at it for um, patients ages zero to 19, we really have not had any improvements in the survival curve in over 30 plus years, despite all the different types of therapies that we provide to these patients. So we provide surgery to resect out these ugly brain tumors. We provide radiation therapy to really combat the growth of these tumors. And then myself as an oncologist, we prescribe a chemotherapy. And all of that treatment is really directed at this disease here, but these survival curves are dismal and poor despite all that multimodality therapy. Now there are many different challenges as to why the uh, survival curve is so poor. One of the many challenges is the blood brain barrier. So a lot of times people will say, well, how can it be the blood brain barrier? If you look at an MRI, you'll see contrast and you'll see that that bright spot there in peach, we can see it um, light up on MRI. But what you need to know is that if you look at the core of the tumor, we actually have a very permeable blood tumor barrier. Um, here designated in this graphical illustration, you'll see these blue dots. They get out to this very aggressive um, glioma tumors he's seen here in Peach. So we're like, hooray, that's where we can get therapy to. Yet, when you go further and further away from the core of the tumor, you actually see an impermeable BBB, BTB, where we're not getting a lot of great therapy that's um, taken up by the vasculature to these aggressive tumor cells. So when the neurosurgeon goes to resect the tumor, he, she, or they are resecting out the core and sometimes some of the peritumoral area, but they definitely are not touching the distant site area. The radiation oncologist definitely um, promotes and utilizes the tools to be able to provide radiation therapy to the core and to the peritumoral areas. And then as an oncologist, we do the same to that same area. Well, it's six to 12 months later, after we've given everything but the kitchen sink to this area, that we see disease recurrence, either on MRI or we see our patients start to have cognitive decline. We see that they're worsening disease. And it's likely that the therapy has not touched any of this distant or even peritumoral site area, which the surgeon has not gone after, which the radiation therapist has not been able to go after, and definitely our chemotherapy agents have not been able to reach. So our research focus, both in the lab and in the clinical setting, is how can we improve therapies to these peritumoral and distant site areas where the core really does not have an issue? 
So this is just a graphical illustration not made by me, but these are just four of the many options where people have worked to combat the limiting area and the restrictiveness of the blood-brain barrier. So one aspect is to enhance drug permeability by using a drug that has a receptor that um, is being able to be taken up by the drug. So if the drug is in the vasculature, then it's taken up. Um, by something that's receptor mediated. And so then it gets to the brain or the brain tumor. That's one way. A second way is temporary disruption of the BBB. So there've been a lot of studies over the years to use um, osmotic disruption with mannitol intraarterially. That's one aspect. Then there's interstitial delivery via catheters. So this is a convection enhanced delivery type picture where you can give therapies directly um, to the brain tumor. And then there's use of polymers or chips where they're already impregnated with a certain type of chemotherapy and then it gets to that area. Now, the issue with all four of these is a distribution issue. So even in the context, if we're talking about catheter um, delivery, the amount of drug that gets to what, if you can recall, the core versus peritumoral to distant is not vast. And so the catheter, these gliadel type impregnated wafers, the intraarterial mannitol, it gets to certain areas, but it's mostly precluded to the core and some aspects of the peritumor, but not at all those distant site areas. Also, if you're aware, there are clinical trials um, at multiple institutions looking at focused ultrasound. And so there's many different high versus low focused ultrasound opportunities. And that is an additional way to mechanically open the blood brain barrier, which people have seen um, is very helpful in certain brain tumors, but even still there's issues of drug uh, distribution. And so then that just leads us to say, well, what can we do to really focus our studies to improve the drug delivery? And so our three main aims within the lab and in the clinical setting are one, to characterize time-dependent changes of the BBB and BTB during uh, glioma progression. Two, to identify and pharmacologically target common signaling pathways involved in glioma stem cell self-renewal and BBB BTB integrity. And then three, to determine the penetration of currently used chemotherapeutic agents, and that's my pharmacology focus and interest, into these um, brain tumors. So how much drug actually gets to the core peritumoral and distant site areas? And so in the context of time and interest and uh, all the paperwork I had to fill out to be here, I'm going to focus more on AIM-2 and AIM-3. And so I'll tell you about a story where I utilized a actually a cardiac stress drug to go bench to bedside, back to bench. So regadenosin, regadenosin is an adenosine A2A receptor agonist. It actually acts on adenosine receptors. It um, uh, connects with the adenosine receptor to increase cyclic AMP. It increases vascular smooth muscle relaxation and increases um, net cardiac perfusion. Now, why that is important. So if you were to go to your doctor and you say, doc, I'm having some chest pain, what should I do? The doctor would say, okay, let's set you up for a, a treadmill stress test. Have you walk on a treadmill, see if we see any blockage of the vessels around your heart. And then we can go from there if you need a bypass or if you need to get any type of therapies or unblock that area. Well, if for some reason you weren't able to walk on the treadmill, you'd get this cardiac stress drug, just as if you had just walked on the treadmill and you'd be able to see if there was any blockage of the vessels around their heart. Well, interesting enough, this FDA approved drug used for an alternative to treadmill cardiac stress testing and about 26% of patients causes headaches. This headache is due to the vasodilation that happens not just in the vessels around the heart, but also in the brain. Well, there was a group out of Cornell that found that if this vasodilation is happening in the brain and the heart, what if we utilize that information and then looked, could we see an increase in drug delivery to the brain with this cardiac stress drug? And what they found is if they looked in their um, rodents, so mice and rats, and they gave a 60 kilodalton dextran molecule, so something super, super large, um, they could see within a short period of time, two to four hours, increased concentration of this uh, sugar protein, the 70 kilodalton sugar protein within the brain of these non-tumor bearing animals. So we said, oh, that's interesting. This cardiac stress drug does something up here and brings in more therapy. What if we could do the same, but more for our chemotherapy interests? So we did just that. 
We looked at non-tumor bearing rats. We gave them regadenosine, this cardiac stress drug, and we gave them temozolomide. Temozolomide is the standard of care chemotherapy agent for adult brain tumor patients with malignant gliomas. And we saw a 60% increase in the concentration of in, of temozolomide in the brain just two hours after we gave the combination of temozolomide plus regadenosin. So we said, oh, that's interesting. But then by six hours, it had gone back down to kind of baseline um, uh, concentration values within the brain of these animals. So we said, okay, there seems to be a transient effect, which is good. We don't want vasodilation in a person or an animal to have all this headache for a long period of time. And we do want to get our drug of interest in, but we don't want it to um, debilitate and cause more systemic toxicities. So with that 60% increase and seeing that response, we said, what if it was different or we could see a similar type of effect for patients who have a space occupying lesion such as glioma? So before I go into the details of the bench to the bedside, I just want to inform you of a tool. So there's this thing called microdialysis. So microdialysis has been used in the traumatic brain injury setting for decades. It is what is seen here in this graphical illustration, really small, thin plastic tubing that neurosurgeons can place at the time of traumatic brain injury, at the time of some type of surgical resection or biopsy. And it really serves as a sampling tool. So we're able to use artificial CSF uh oh, this pointer is not working anymore. Jeff? It stopped. On this one, you said it's not as strong. Anyway, so what? Yeah, try that one. Okay. This one's not as working. So we'll say that you can see on the left and on the right, you can use a pump with artificial CSF or um, very much akin to lactated ringer solution, but we'll infuse through this microdialysis catheter very slowly, 0.5 to one microliter per minute. And then over time, the microdialysis catheter then serves kind of like a capillary where you have this passive diffusion of solute where we're able to get extracellular fluid or dialysate from these brain tumor. And so this graphical illustration shows that you have two catheters in place one in the tumor and one in what could be distant or peritumoral site areas. And so then from that, we're able to measure drug concentration or metabolite concentration or cytokine concentration. So it's a great tool to be able to measure all these things in a time dependent manner um, with the, the thought of what well, are we getting things to where we want them to go over that time period. And so this tool has been shown to be helpful to look at just brain to plasma concentrations at a one time period, but really over time where you can look at the area under the curve or you can look at the clearance of the drug. And this is just an example of drug X versus Y. And so there have been a few glioma studies that have benefited from microdialysis use. And it's really helpful to look at microdialysis um, in the context of drug concentrations because it's more than just one moment at time. You can pair it with tissue studies where we look at pharmacodynamics, and it's optimally done at the time of surgery. So the surgeon would already be going in and um, providing some relief of the tumor and the inflammation that comes along with that, and thus getting additional information regarding what's going on in the tumor microenvironment. And so in the context of what studies have been done to date, looking at these pharmaco neuropharmacokinetics, there have been studies looking at methotrexate, timozolomide, cisplatin, 5-fluorouracil, cytokines, and electrolytes. And it's mostly been done in the recurrence disease area and all focus in cortical disease. And so I'll touch base a little bit on that as I talk about our current open clinical trial. So back to our bench to bedside, back to bench story. So we then looked at the information where we saw non-tumor bearing rats that received uh, regadenosine and temozolomide. They had that 60% increase. And we said, what if we open a multi-institutional phase zero trial, we enrolled patients who had recurrent glioblastoma, and then looked at the safety and feasibility of the amount of temozolomide sampling and measurement. So patients received oral temozolomide before surgery. They received regadenosine, 
excuse me, not at surgery, they received oral temozolomide just after surgery. And so then they were able to see if regadenosine, which was given at the bedside, if we could see increased concentrations of temozolomide, that same 60% um, at the time of uh, drug concentration um, being given or being sampled in this dialysate. So drum roll, do you think that we saw this 60% increase? No, we didn't. Um, <laughs> well, we did see it and we saw it in two patients, two out of the five patients, and we didn't see the 60% increase. In patient two, we saw 55%. In patient five, we saw 32%. And we saw that the increase was early in the time of drug application or administration. In that first 10 hours, in that first 10 hours, it was higher. Interesting enough, patient two and patient five did complain of headaches. So is that a correct biomarker for response? Maybe, just maybe. So I'm comparing temozolomide alone. So that's the blue. So that was day one versus temozolomide with regadenosine on day two um, with this patient who had just gone to the OR one day prior and I was getting, giving them a cardiac stress test in the uh, the ICU. I started to have a cardiac stress test as the uh, <laughs> cardiologist is pushing the drug. So we said... Well, this didn't work like what, how we wanted it to work. This wasn't the 60% we saw in these non-tumor bearing rats. What's happening at the cellular and molecular level? So this led us to go back to the bench. And so I had a previous poke stock that was very much interested in these studies. And so we looked at glioma bearing rats this time. We gave them regadenosine, we gave them temozolomide and wanted to see what the effect was happening at the tissue or the molecular and the cellular level. And so first we were able to show that we could see decreased Claudin-5 expression. So Claudin-5 is one of the tight junction proteins amongst endothelial cells. So if you think about uh, the endothelial cells coming together to form these nice vascular units, these tight junctions such as Claudin-5, Occludin, ZL1, they all come together to ensure that these... Um, the amount of uh, integrity is great for the BBB or the endothelium. Well, we found that when we gave temozolomide plus regadenosine, we could see the um, decreased Claudin-5 expression, which tells you that these endothelial cells are coming apart. And then when we looked at the concentration in these tumor bearing animals, we were like, are we gonna see a 60% increase? We saw definitely an increase in the tumor to plasma. So that's the injected side of the brain versus the non-injected side. So the non-injected side is brain to plasma. The injected side of tumor cells is the tumor to plasma. And we saw maybe a 40, 42% increase in temozolomide concentration. So we said, okay, we see decreased Claudin-5, we see increased temozolomide concentration. What if we gave a repeated dosing and see if we could prolong survival in these animals? What do you think? Do you think we saw prolonged survival? No, we didn't see prolonged survival. So when we look at temozolomide alone with um, just seen here in orange versus temozolomide with the regadenosin, you don't see a survival advantage when you give this repeated doses. So science is science. And sometimes you get the hypothesis that you first generated that you thought would be right versus not. And overall, you just get more questions. And our takeaways were one, that the timing of the BBB BTB disruption matters. So I showed you that Claudin-5 goes down, which is one of the junctional proteins. I showed you that temozolomide goes up in these tumor um, models. But that was only at that one period of time. So that's not that in no way then gave uh, the ability for there to be increased survival when we did repeat um, exposure of the regadenosine. So that's just one aspect of the bigger story. We showed that if you give regadenosine, which is more focused on the vascular endothelium, causes vasodilation, that alone is not sufficient to say we're going to increase BBB, BTB permeability. If you can recall from my larger graphical illustration in the beginning, the BBB is composed of so many different cells. So you have astrocytes and pericytes and endothelium. So just a drug that works just on endothelium alone is not going to fit the bill. And then third, it's all about how much drug gets in. And it's very important for us to really explore that avenue within the neuro-oncology space. So with all that data, we said, okay, well, what do we do next? What other agents do we look at? Regadenosin is just one of many different um, vascular type of therapies. So then that leads us to um, our aim to that really is looking at 
how can we kill two birds with one stone? And forgive me because I'm a, a vegetarian, so I'm really not so much of killing two birds with one stone, but you all know the idiom of us wanting to be able to hit both the BBB integrity and also the glioma cells and to really target the common signaling pathways that we find in glioma stem cell self-renewal as well as BBB, BTB integrity. So this is the section where I'm not gonna go too, too much about what I have ongoing, but more on the assays and how we can look to collaborate ideas. So I have a few in vitro and in vivo things that I'd be happy to collaborate with you all on. So we use Excelligence. It's a tool where we can look at cell to cell adhesion. And so it's exactly how it um, sounds. So electron flow. So if we start with just culture media on this electron flow, so this pointer is not too much working, so we'll just put it down. Um, if we look at just electron flow from cell to cell, if we are to add cells to this um, gold electrode, we're able to see what the cell to cell kissing or cell to cell adhesion and interaction is over time. And so if there's impeded electron flow because these cells to cell are kissing or interacting, then we see decreased cell in index. If we see that the cells are kissing or interacting, we see increased cell index. And so this is just an example of if we add an agent here on the close to the y-axis, we can see the different readouts if we give a high dose or a low dose or positive control that we know is supposed to affect the cell-to-cell -cell interaction or the cell index. We can also look at it in the context of tumor cells where we'll give an agent that, um, not just a drug, but we can add in conditioned media to these endothelial cells that are here on this gold electrode picking up the electrical cell-cell adhesion and seeing if the conditioned media, so that's the glioma stem cells, and they're putting out different cytokines, different growth factors that then can affect these endothelial cells and cause for uh, decreased cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. We also do simple in vitro BBB, BTB assays, where we look at trans wells, we um, add endothelial cells, we wait till they become confluent, and then we can add in a fluorescent dye to see how well that fluorescent dye then leaks down into the bottom of the trans well. And in this picture, I have no cells at the bottom of the trans well, but definitely we can place astrocytes, pericytes, glioma cells to see if that dye goes down or any other agent of interest goes down. And we can look at endothelial disrupting agent to see if that allows for more fluorescent dye to go down to the bottom trans well. And these are just some representative images of ZO1 as another tight junction um, protein. So we should see that if the cells are together, you have high membrane expression on IF images. And these are just um, some examples of if you were to give a drug at a certain time period, you'd see a level of disruption or these cell to cell interactions being less or less linear and more point adhesions. So that's the more simple BBB BTB setup. We also are using the same Excelligence uh, tool that we use for the cell to cell adhesion for an in inverted in vitro BBB BTB model where we're able to incorporate our endothelial cells, our astrocytes and our pericytes. So we use a very similar trans well setup it's not a, a dynamic, but a static way for us to look at these varied cells. And so you can see endothelial cells here in orange, pericytes in blue, astrocytes in green, but we in essence will plate our endothelial cells. The endothelial cells will be on this gold electrode so that we can measure the cell to cell interaction very much akin to the cell cell adhesion studies from one of the earlier slides. We allow those endothelial cells to grow and to become attached to the gold electrode. And we actually flip that, um, kind of trans well upside down after the cells have been adhered. And then we add in our, our astrocytes and our pericytes, allow them to grow. And we have a triple culture model that then we're able to do a readout of cell to cell interaction or cell index. And it's definitely higher as we add in pericytes and astrocytes versus endothelial cells alone. So again, this is another tool that we could add in a drug or we can add in condition media to really see what um, hinders this cell-to-cell -cell communication and, and um, interaction or cell index. 
And then when we think about cell to cell interaction, it's not just the cells kissing that are important, but something called ABC transporters or multi-drug resistance proteins you all have heard of. So this is just a graphical illustration of ZO1, Claudin, occludin, junctional adhesion molecules, all the things that come together to make these tight and adherence junctions or these endothelial cells to kiss. But it's also important to think about these ABC transporters such as P-glycoprotein, also called multi-drug resistance protein one, um, ABCG2, also called BCRP. These are things that are highly expressed on endothelial cells and happen to be highly expressed on glioma cells. So you think you're getting a drug in because you've opened up the tight junctions, but if the ABC transporter of function is high, then it's gonna uh, shoot that same drug right on out of the cell. So it's important that if we're gonna think about transiently opening the BBB, we also look at the function of these ABC transporters in the same vein. And so we have the ability to do so where we incubate our endothelial cells or our glioma cells or whatever our cells of interest are with a certain dye. And that dye has to be a substrate of that ABC transporter. So for example, ABCB1, um, a substrate for ABCB1 transporter is rhodamine. So we can incubate our cells with this fluorescent rhodamine dye, and then we can give a known inhibitor of rhodamine or known inhibitor of ABCB1, and we can see a shift to the right, which is meaning that the rhodamine stays in the cell. Or we can give our drug X and compare it to that known inhibitor of ABCB1. Because sometimes people will say, well, the expression is high for ABCB1 or the expression is high for ABCG2, but it's not so much about the expression and more about the function, how much drug is being effluxed. And so this is another tool that we use to say our drug is um, being helpful or not being helpful. And then it's always great to have preclinical models. So drug concentrations, so to look at pharmacokinetics, to look at pharmacodynamics, we utilize MRI imaging to look at the size of our tumor with varied chemotherapies or drug disrupting agents. We can also look at um, extravasation of dextran or Evans blue. So Evans blue is a super huge uh, molecule that attaches to albumin. Albumin should not be in your brain. So if you use some disruption agent like focus ultrasound or some other type of agent, maybe like regadenosine, and you think that you're opening up the BBB, you would not want to just know how, how long you open up the BBB, but by how big. And so timozolomide is a small chemotherapy agent, but Evans Blue or Dextrin is a large agent. So for us to know what the capacity to be able to open the BBB is very important. I talked about the use of microdialysis in the clinical setting, but also it can be used in the preclinical setting. So we have this set up to perform microdialysis catheter use both in the injected side and the non-injected side. So these aren't my pictures, but it's from another study where they use microdialysis and they placed it in the injected side, as you can see on the H&E and the non-injected side to see about distal versus core and potentially peritumoral, depending on where you place the catheter. But this is a great means to be able to say how much drug gets to this area over this certain time. And then you can translate that into the clinical trial studies. And then the last way in terms of preclinical studies are we have this ability to do multiplex BBB BTB staining. So I'm not planning to publish these studies so I can show you these pretty pictures. So U87 is a somewhat glioma cell. So about five plus years ago, everybody was on the train of using these human derived, uh, human glioma cells. And then over the last mm, three years, people have said mm, U87 is really not a glioma. So I got these beautiful pictures that I'll show you that I can never utilize because people don't respect the use of U87. But I say all that to say that multiplex staining in this context has been helpful for us to use more um, human derived glioma cells, glioma stem cells, and look to see about what happens over time in terms of growth patterns for the uh, amongst the BBB BTB. So these U87s were green fluorescent. And so you can see here where the tumor was injected in relationship to the whole brain. And this was five days after these tumor cells had been injected in the mouse. 
And then when we looked at Claudin-5, which is the tight junction protein, or Collagen-4, which is an endothelial cell marker, we can see where the expression of the vasculature is in the context of the tumor. Now, zooming in, we just wanted to see, like I stated, what's happening at the core, what's happening at the peritumoral, what's happening at the distant site areas. So zooming in, you can see where the tumor is here in green. You can see where the collagen uh, expression is here, collagen four expression, that's the endothelium. You can see it's very disorganized in the aspect of the tumor versus the normal contralateral brain. You can see that the Z01 or the tight junction expression is actually less in the core of the tumor and more organized and more prevalent in the distant area. Claudin five expression, interesting enough, is higher in the uh, injected tumor side area and less on the control side. And just overall, you can see that there's more disorganized endothelium and higher staining within the core of the tumor. And so we took this information, we're now utilizing it um, to look at our human derived glioma cells. And knowing that U87 is not the best tumor model, because as you can see, GFAP is an astrocyte marker, and these astrocytes are only being stained on the outside and not internally to these, uh, this tumor tissue. So our ongoing studies are looking at, you, you are using all of these various in vitro and preclinical um, techniques. And so one of the aspects is looking at tricellular junction inhibition and glioma stims, stimness. So the two for one special that I had talked about, so how can we disrupt the endothelium, but also impact our glioma cells all at once? We're also looking at how can we inhibit drug efflux as well as the junctional expression to usher in more drugs to kill these tumor cells. And then I'll talk to you shortly about an open clinical trial where we're looking at CNS permeability of abemaciclib, which is a drug targeting agent to uh, diffuse midline glioma. So then that leads us to AIM-3. Determine the penetration of currently used chemotherapeutic agents into malignant gliomas and peritumoral tissue using intracerebral microdialysis. So we have an open trial now using abemaciclib. Abemaciclib is a potent cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitor, and it works here on the cell cycle um, to inhibit CDK4-6 and cyclin D1 to inhibit a um retinoblastoma gene, and then inhibit the whole progression of the cell cycle. Well, all our cells need the cell cycle to go through, but definitely these tumor cells are really dependent on this cell cycle. And what we know about these malignant gliomas is that there's a lot of dysregulation of the G1S cell cycle checkpoint. And we see that in malignant gliomas, both in the cortex and both in the midline. And I'll tell you in just a second that this agent specifically has been shown to prolong survival in both primary and metastatic brain cancer. It's actually an FDA approved drug for metastatic breast cancer to the brain. One of the questions that I had in thinking about this cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor is, what are the effects of abemaciclib on diffuse midline glioma? So for the majority of the talk, I've talked more about cortical-based uh, brain tumors, but not so much midline tumors. So abemaciclib has really shown to have some potential in newly diagnosed GBM. And so that's why we're looking at it in the context of uh, midline tumor. So there was a group, uh, a large consortium group, more in the adult brain tumor setting that looked at newly diagnosed unmethylated glioblastoma patients. They biomark and genotype these patients to look to see what molecular kind of classification they fell under because these tumors are very heterogeneous. And then these patients were randomized to any different treatment groups. So one of the treatment groups was abemaciclib with radiation therapy and temozolomide. Remember, that's the standard of care chemotherapy. And then they received adjuvant abemaciclib during maintenance therapy. And they wanted to look at progression-free survival, and they wanted to look at overall survival. So to date, there have been 123 patients, 50 control patients, and 73 treated with abemaciclib on that specific arm of the trial. Abemaciclib was generally well tolerated with no new toxicity and progression-free survival was found to be significantly longer for those patients who received abemaciclib. So 6.31 months versus the control arm of five months. Now you may say, well, what's the difference in one month? 
the difference in one, one month is significant when we know that this disease is just so aggressive and that we don't have great treatment op options to prolong survival. So that this is an ongoing study, but this is the most uh, updated report of how this agent has helped to prolong survival and is really well tolerated. So then that brings us back to the neuropharmacokinetics of diffuse midline glioma. So what we know about CNS drug delivery is that it's often determined by rodents and postmortem studies. And that often when you think about how much drug gets to the midline versus the cortex, it's usually extrapolated data from the cortex. Now, this is a gross image of what the brain looks like. So if you look at the spongy cortex versus what I have highlighted in green, which is the very compact tissue of the midline, which includes the pons, the medulla, the midbrain, the architecture is clearly different. So there's no way that you're gonna say that a drug, whatever it is, is getting into the brain, the spongy cortex, in the same amount, in the same time, in the same capacity as you would the midline tumors. So there was a group actually at the NIH that looked at non-human primates and they looked at temozolomide concentration in the cortex versus the pons. You remember here, the pons is here down at the bottom. And they found that basically there was a five-fold difference almost between the cortex and the pond when they did microdialysis in the extracellular fluid sampling. So we can't say that drug X or Y or Z, because it can cross into the CNS, it has the same amount of penetration and the same amount of vigor in, that, in those midline structures of the brain versus the cortex. There's just no way. So our aim in our now open trial enrolling is to utilize abemaciclib and microdialysis in a phase zero one to look at the safety and feasibility of intratumoral microdialysis placement and sampling using the same microdialysis tool that I've described to you previously for the regadenosin studies to measure intratumoral versus systemic abemaciclib and to explore long-term follow-up with combination abemaciclib and temozolomide. So if we think about the study schema, so my neurosurgeon of interest is Dr. Brown at the NIH. And so he is involved to help with the placement of these microdialysis catheters, as well as surgical resection. But the patients will come to us either with the cortical tumors or midline tumors. And then for four and a half days, they take a bimaciclib. This is outpatient. And then on the day of surgery, they take their very last dose right before they go to the OR. And depending on where the tumor is and how big it is, they either get a resection or they get a biopsy. And then a catheter is placed. With that tissue that we're able, that Dr. Brown is able to obtain, we're able to measure abemaciclib concentrations. We're able to see PD effect of cell cycle inhibition, so that retinoblastoma gene down, uh, down expression and down regulation. We're able to do genomic profiling. And if we have any tissue left over, then we're able to do PDX modeling. And then for the next 48 hours, these patients have these microdialysis catheters in place, and we're able to measure brain extracellular fluid and measure the amount of imemaciclib in the extracellular fluid within the brain, as well as in the rest of the body to see how much is actually getting to the midline structures or the cortical tumor. And then right at the bedside, the catheter is removed. And then over those next two to four weeks of just post-operative healing, we're able to do a go, no go aspect where we able to get the results from how much drug is in the brain versus how much drug is in the plasma and say, let's restart a bimaciclib because it's reached a, a certain threshold for inhibition, which is 10 nanomolar per liter. And let's restart it with temozolomide. So because not, I'm not allowed, I can't tell you the results uh, so far, but they have been positive. I can show you just um, one example of a CT and MRI overlay where Dr. Brown placed a catheter, just one catheter in this one patient. And so we were able to see exactly where contrast enhancing MRI um, designation of the catheter placement versus us getting our data. Um, so very exciting times for us to enroll more patients and to learn more about the neuropharmacokinetics as it relates to these diffuse midline gliomas, but also utilizing this agent that has been previously shown to provide a benefit for newly diagnosed patients with G uh, glioblastoma. So the overall summary for AIM-3 is that 
We hypothesize that intratumoral and peritumoral sampling along with molecular profiling and pharmacodynamics will predict treatment response and that intratumoral bemaciclib sampling via microdialysis is safe and feasible. We have ongoing pharmacodynamic studies and PDX modeling to understand more about this disease. I talked to you about the preclinical microdialysis studies and how that's so beneficial and important to be able to advance this field. We're looking at uh, temozolomide, we're looking at abemaciclib in these preclinical microdialysis um, studies, but also looking at new agents that we think can disrupt and cause some increased drug delivery with great attention to the distant site areas. And then our takeaway is that intracerebral glioma ECF sampling is a feasible adjunct to both our preclinical and clinical management and should be used more often in the adult and pediatric brain setting. So in no time have um, the microdialysis tool been used in children who have brain tumors. So I'm really pushing for that use more in the pediatric setting. So overall, we do therapeutic targeting of the blood tumor barrier in malignant gliomas. We have time-dependent changes that we look into, dual role therapies and pharmacology, and I love it. I, I really enjoy my job. It gets to be challenging. I serve multiple hats as I do it, um, and it's exciting. So I'm happy to be here to be able to give talks, and I like to be able to give reference to the fact that NIH and science isn't everything for me. So I've done a lot of things both in the NIH community and outside of the NIH community in the neuro-oncology um, um, field, even doing STEM at home with my kids. I can't point to, but this right left corner, I've done Facebook Live to talk about being a woman in the STEM environment and speaking up for others who are un un underrepresented in the field of science and medicine. So I will continue to do that. And I don't know what happened to, I guess they are finished with me talking. Okay. And <laughs> I will continue to speak out in terms of uh, being able to improve and be more equitably, equitable and inclusive for our field. So interesting enough, I am the only black pediatric neuro-oncologist in all of the US. So not female, but black. And so I want there to be more I want there to be more people that are um, represented in this field, uh, taking care of patients, doing this research and being making sure that we are including more people of color as part of our clinical trials and our research specimens. So, and me being able to speak up and be able to give talks like this and collaborate that then allows the world to know that this research is important. So I thank you for your time. I have a lot of people that have helped to allow me to be here and I have open postdoc positions. So if you know anyone or anybody on the interwebs here, please let it be known. What time is it? Did I talk too long? <laughs> thank you for your uh, wonderful no. talk. Oh, can, can we maybe do one question in the room or one or two questions here and then jump to the folks online if that would be easier? Yeah. Hey, hey, Kathleen, this is Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, can you hear me? Can I ask a question now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So a uh, very nice talk. So I'm wondering, you know, whether the, the agents that you have tested are only able to transiently open the uh, blood barrier or B BTB. So like, I'm wondering whether you, you know, you, you have to open the blood barrier every time before you know the chemotherapy chemotherapeutic drugs. That would be the intent that we would have to give an agent either right before or right after we give our chemotherapy agent, and it would have to be a repeated uh, thing because we don't want it to just stay open indefinitely. And do you think like the uh, if there is any side effects like if you open the blood barrier often? So we're not sure as of right now. Um, we have not seen anything of that. Uh, one of the big questions that people had for my previous regular innocent trial is, well, if you open the BBB, then aren't okay. you going to usher more um, 
infectious agents there and cause more headaches. And we did not see that or appreciate that in the one-time dose. Interesting enough, just physiologically, when we go to sleep, our BBB becomes more permeable. So there's different times throughout the day, definitely at nighttime, where our BBB is more open. It helps with clearance of just like toxins throughout the day, probably emotional clearance too in our dreams. But um, we are doing more research to capitalize more about that research to then um, think through if you're repeatedly opening the BBB, what kind of deleterious effects it could have. And in the middle uh, middle part of your talk, so you, you mentioned that uh, a drug that you use um, disrupt the epithelial cells and or um, uh, prevents the ABC uh, transporter function so and did you see any uh did you have tested in animal models that with uh, brain tumors whether you know this approach can uh, uh prolong animal survival yes so yes okay. yes so that should be uh, coming out soon <laughs> okay yeah thank you uh hello dr jackson can you hear me yes i can hi i'm um, sorry you can't see me i guess but uh, this is mike friedlander i'm the director of the family biomedic research institute so first i want to thank you a wonderful seminar and all the good work you do. Thank you very much. I wish I could be there. We're here in Roanoke. Um, but I do have one, one specific scientific question I'd like to ask you. Uh, since we know that uh, these uh, glioblastomas um, can have an effect on a variety of cells that you mentioned, including parasites, astrocytes, and the thelial cells, in terms of the brain tumor itself affecting the permeability, the blood-brain barrier, I was wondering in the different cases, whether it be the animals in the lab or in the human clinical research, do you have a do you have a good sense before treatment to modulate blood brain barrier of the level of disruption of that by that specific brain tumor in that particular animal or patient? So the studies that I talked about preclinical, where we do the Evans blue dye or we do the dextran permeability. So it's usually three kilodalton dextran. So that's a large um dye that we can see. We'll always compare uh, an a animal, a PDX animal uh, that has got ha, that has been given a BBB disrupting agent along with a non-BBB disrupting agent. So we can know baseline how much the BBB is already disrupted from these injected tumor cells. And, and how variable is that uh, between animals, the amount of disruption you get initially? So it depends on the glioma stem cells that we inject or if it's rat derived glioma stem cells. It depends on the timing, how long the tumor has, uh, how long it's been since we injected. So there's just various um, timing and the amount of cells. We try to normalize the amount of cells. So that's not so much of an issue, but it really is dependent on the timing and the type of cells that we inject. Great. Thank you very much. Also in the room here, Dr. G. Shang. Uh, has a question for Hi, you. Dr. Jackson. Um, so I have a very quick question. Have you ever used uh, Fox ultrasound to open the BBB to treat glioma? So my lab does not at all focus on focus ultrasound, focus on focus, focus on focus ultrasound. There is another investigator at the NIH that that is his whole lab, focus ultrasound. So it's important that we each have our, our niche. That's just not my niche. Happy to collaborate, though. Thank you. If I could just ask a question, really great seminar again, really interested. I was curious about your choice of drug with abemaciclib. Obviously, it's been really successful in breast cancer, but surprisingly less successful in most other solid tumors it's been tested in. And so, of course, there was high hopes with the CDK4-6 inhibitors with so many tumors driven by RB mutations, P53 loss, P21 loss, P16 loss, that the CDK4-6 inhibitors in theory should be a slam dunk. We really haven't seen that, right? Clinically, they're really only used in breast cancer. So I was wondering why you chose abemaciclib over other molecules that might target the G1S or other, yep. you know, division. So this one specifically has been shown to have great CNS penetration but more in the cortical setting. And then two, because of that trial that um, had positive results in the newly diagnosed uh, cortical GBM setting. Great, thank you. And we just have a question online from Javad Nazarian. He wants to know how much of the staining that you see in your mouse model from the microdialysis catheter is due to scaring rather than true BBB, BTB. Oh, scarring? Scarring, I apologize, scarring. Oh, scarring. 
So we haven't started to do multiplex staining in our um, microdialysis preclinical models, um, but that is a good question. So usually 24 hours after we place these catheters, um, there's a, just a normal amount of BBB disruption. So we would expect to see actually increased permeability in that first 24 hours. So we usually wait after that 24 hours before we start our drug concentration sampling. Um, but it's kind of pending on what the results look like for the multiplex staining for those um, animals that have had a catheter in place post postmortem multiplex staining. So Javad knows my email, so we can we can be uh, we can chat offline to to talk about collaborations around that. Okay, sounds great. Does anyone else in the room here or at FBRI Roanoke have any more questions before we thank uh, Dr. Jackson again? Any more questions? Okay, thank you so much for your time and a great presentation.